Good evening, Commonwealth, and thanks for watching the Channel 2 News. I'm Ashley McDowell. Let's take a look at tonight's top stories. CNMI residents eagerly await their stimulus checks. We have the details on the process. Also tonight, more amendments are made to the executive order, which include penalties. And CNMI House representatives may have a fix to the 25% deduction of the retirees' pension benefits. Stay with us, these stories and more are next. We are with you. At times when you need us most, you can count on us to be there. When you need someone to talk to, when you need to stay informed, when you need to brighten your day, when you need to stay connected, we are here keeping our promise that while the world is changing, we keep working so you can keep connecting. We are your Docomo Pacific family and we are here to help. Hoffa Day, Tirwami, and Good Evening Commonwealth. Today is Friday, April 17th, 2020. With thousands out of work, CNMI residents eagerly await their stimulus checks. Our Sally Lemus sits down with Finance Secretary David Adelig, who gives guidance on the process. Okay, so can you tell us more about the uh, corona relief packages that uh, the CNMI is expecting? We did receive word that the U.S. territories will be receiving their uh, stimulus um, funding uh, by mid-May, and then uh, the, our treasury, CNMI treasury, uh, in coordination with our department or division of tax uh, revenue and taxation, will be distributing these uh, checks to our um, residents. The economic impact payment are for all tax filers with an income of $75,000, or for couples, $150,000. And if they had filed in 2018, this is the data that we're providing uh, IRS. They will, for, for those uh, individuals, 75,000 or less will get $1,200. For couples, it's 2,400. And then in addition, 500 per uh, child or dependent um, minors will get 500 per child. And um, if they did not file 2018 or, you know, or they filed in 2019, uh, we would most likely be using the 2019 um, if it's an updated um, gross income value of 75000 or less. The, um, for those that have not filed 2018 and 19, they could still qualify they just, they would need to submit a zero income tax return to revenue and taxation. Forms can be downloaded on our website, you know, at finance.gov.mp, and, and the forms can be downloaded, filled out, and dropped off at revenue and tax. Uh, they, they have a drop box outside, um, where you can off your tax returns. So those with zero income, it's still a veil of the stimulus. Oh, wow. Okay. So everyone is encouraged though. Uh, everyone is encouraged. If you have a valid social security number and, a, um, and a legal resident status, you uh, 
you are most likely qualified to receive the stimulus check. And Atalik says the Sina now has the option of direct deposit. Yes, this is a portal information. It's mirrored uh, with the IRS portal uh, where people can um, submit should, you know, because the data we have is for 2018 file uh, tax returns. If they have a change of address, change of PO box, change of banking information, or in this case, we uh, we don't have the banking information. So this will be an opportunity for the taxpayers to enter in their banking information so that they can receive uh, their stimulus checks direct deposit. I encourage everyone to do this because this will be the fastest way you'll get it. And so we hope to have this portal up and running by the end of the month. Residents are encouraged to be prepared with the correct information when using the portal. The information that they provided in their tax return. So their legal name, uh, address, phone number, contact information, uh, their banking information, and which we will match and verify against our records um, to ensure that um, it is the right taxpayer that is uh, submitting their information. And then um, uh, I want the taxpayers to be sure that this will be a secured site as well as a um, secured and confidential and only um, Privy to our uh, Department of Finance staff, uh, most likely the Division of Revenue Taxation. And so it's just to verify all their information and get their banking information so we can provide them their direct deposit for their student. The Department of Finance, together with Revenue and Taxation, are working around the clock to make this a smooth process for the residents. And you may call their office for more information. I'm Sally Lemis for KSPN News. Governor Torres has made more amendments to Executive Order 2020-4, declaring a state of public health emergency. As of today, April 17, 2020, the CNMI has 13 confirmed cases of COVID-19, two deaths, and nine recoveries, with CHCC awaiting the results of four specimens. Governor Torres states the result of the low numbers of infected individuals is due to the social distancing measures that have been put into place. Governor Torres has made some amendments to Executive Order 2020-4, declaring a state of public health emergency that will further enforce the directives. Some amendments that have been made to Emergency Directive 11 include penalties for violating social distancing mandates. What the governor has imposed is that first-time offense violators will be subject to a fine of $100 for not complying with the social distancing mandate. What that means is the six-feet-apart rule and folks maintaining that distance in all public areas, such as public beaches, pathways, and businesses, and during exercise and wellness on the pathways and beaches as well, um, as well as gatherings of more than 10 people. That's prohibited under this mandate within the directive. So first-time violators will be subject to a fine of 100 bucks. Second-time often um, offense violators will be subject to a fine of $250 and or up to three days imprisonment. And third-time or more offense violators will be subject to a fine of $500 and or up to six months imprisonment. Another amendment has been made to Directive 14, where penalties for violating business hours will be implemented. Penalties for violating business mandates are... First-time offense violators will be subject to immediate closure of their business establishment for a period of one month. Second-time op offense violators will be subject to immediate closure of their business establishment for a period of six months. And third-time or more offense violators will be subject to immediate closure of their business establishment for a period of one year. And Governor Torres has made an amendment to Emergency Directive 16 that gives penalties for violating curfew mandates for adults and minors. Penalties for violating the curfew mandate, first-time offense violators were found in public, including individuals found driving on a public road outside of the curfew hours, will be subject to a fine of $200. Second-time violators were found in public, including individuals found driving on the public roads outside of the curfew hours, will be subject to a fine of $500. And third-time or more violators found in public, including individuals found driving on public roads outside of the designated curfew hours, will be subject to a fine of $750 
and or the impoundment of his or her vehicle by the CMI Department of Public Safety. These amendments to the emergency directives go into effect today, April 17th, 2020. Members of the House minority are reaching out to the governor asking, where is the money? Sally Lemus has this story. Late February of this year, the House minority sent another Open Government Act request to the governor's office. This time, they asked for all records that pertains to the Community Benefit Fund, which is a contractual obligation of Imperial Pacific International to provide funding for community projects. According to the casino license agreement, the office of the governor has the authority to enforce the obligation. Representative Tina Sablon says the governor's office has responded to the OGA, presenting documents that do not show a lot. What we received on March 10th were uh, the, the records that we requested that show that the governor's office can account for about $1.2 million in total for four different programs that received these funds back in 2018, and that's it. There is nothing else in the record to show any other distributions of funds, and under the casino license agreement, IPI was required to contribute $10 million in January 2018, $10 million in June 2018, and another $20 million in October 2019 and every year after that. Imperial Pacific International was obligated to contribute $40 million to the Community Benefit Fund and according to the documents held by the House Minority, the government cannot account for the remaining $38.8 million. He did verify with his legal counsel these are all the records that they have. That was all he could say at that point. Um, and so what we've asked the Gaming Committee chairman to consider doing is to issue a subpoena to IPI to seek their records um, in terms of how these community benefit funds are actually being managed. Um, and if there is some funding that really should be a public benefit, uh, especially if it's something like $38.8 million, we need to hold IPI to that promise and ensure that these benefits are getting out to the people, especially at a time like this. Representative Sheila Babauta, who supports the need of a subpoena, says she just wants information on the CBF. The reason why we feel it's important to bring this conversation up right now is because if there are resources available for our community to look into, then that's what we need to do. We just need to look at all accounts, all available funding that um, may be available. And so I just wanted to, you know, clearly state for the record that the, uh, the Community Benefit Fund is an account under IPI that um, we really have no access to. And so that's why I also support um, the Gaming Committee Chairman to subpoena records from IPI to ensure that they've been meeting their contractual obligation. Um, I do agree that in the language with the agreement, the governor's office was is responsible for enforcing that to make sure that IPI is making their contributions to the um, community benefit fund. And really, we just want to know if there, there's funds in there. Sablon says the Office of the Public Auditor is trying to audit the community benefit fund, which requires cooperation from IPI. This casino license agreement constitutes a whole set of promises that as if one exclusive casino has made to the people of the Commonwealth. And at a time like this, when you know those funds could be used for education, for retirement benefits, for health care, in the middle of this public health emergency, you know, the question that we should all be asking as a governor is is what has what steps have been taken to enforce this this obligation? And if no steps have been taken, why not? Kevin Bautista speaks on behalf of the Office of the Governor, stating many of these establishments have no money. On the issue of IPI paying into the community benefit fund, we understand that there is there are payments that are need that are need that need to be made in order to fill the requirements within um, within the within the agreement. However, the most important thing here to note is that every single investment project is struggling to make ends meet. The governor's office has been strongly consulting with the Attorney General and the Commonwealth Casino Commission on enforcing these mandates. But when we're trying to enforce a mandate in which a company is, is, is obligated to pay, count, but it's money that they do not have because of their financial situation, it's very difficult, it's very difficult within the agreement to, 
to ask for, to, to call for money and request for money that's just not there. KSPN reached out to IPI for comment on the situation, but has not received a response as of press time. The House of Representatives may have a fix to the 25% deduction of the retirees' pension benefits. Sally Lemus reports. On Thursday afternoon, House members met again for the first time since the government shutdown. The session began with a moment of silence for the lives the Commonwealth lost due to the coronavirus. And following the government's advice, House members kept a distance from each other as well as media partners and community members. The first bill discussed, authored by Speaker B.J. Attal, aims to invalidate the casino law and guarantees the 25% of the retirees' pension through the $15 million collected from the annual casino license fee. This legislation will dedicate all $15 million of the license fee that's due every end of August, early September, and will carry the 25% the for the full fiscal year for the retirees. Uh, the legislation itself is not new. Uh, we introduced this legislation in the 19th legislature under 19-21 to do exactly what this legislation is doing. We introduced it in the 20th legislature under 20-28. Unfortunately, it never made it to the governor's desk for his action. But it's our opportunity, as the argument then was, should we ever come into a situation that affects our retirees? This legislation, if we would have had it in place already, would have diverted any of the uh, issues of the 25% of the retirees. Additionally, with, with, uh, with the enactment of what became 1856, the whole intent was to address, the argument was to address the pensioners, the retirees, because after the petty petty council case, they lost their 25%, and a good portion of the retirees lost that 25% for a good 10 or 11 months. When they actually signed the, the bill into law, what became 1856, they took the first year and the fifth year, which is $30 million, and they addressed the retirees 25% and gave them the back payment of their 10 or 11 months. So. This legislation will dedicate the $15 million directly for the retirees and we can remove that issue should anything like this happen in the future. And then the GRT portion will dedicate the uh, $15 million will be distributed to the senatorial districts. The remaining amount of that 10% shall be reserved for emergency purposes such as this today. The bill was unanimously passed, and Finance Secretary David Atalik expresses his support for the legislation. It is the legislature's um, challenge to ensure that our retirees get their full pension. And uh, we understand that the proposed legislation back to the former intent of the, of the casino licensing uh, fees which at that time, obviously, and today, $15 million to pay for the 25% of the settlement fund or the 25% for the retirees' a pension. Um, I have no objections to that um, legislation. Uh, I do want to make sure that we have the revenues and the um, funding to continue paying that. Uh, we are mandated by the federal uh, settlement agreement to only pay 75%. So in absence of funding for the additional 25%, um, I, I believe uh, the legislature is being proactive and, and being responsible in making and ensuring our retirees um, have the funding source to make their pensions whole. And in any way, I, I'm in full support of that. Reporting for KSPN, I'm Sally Lemus. Coming up, free meals are continuing to be provided to children of the CNMI. We have the details after the break. Mom, are you sure? What about the shutters? And do you have your medicine? Don't worry about us, love, okay? You take good care of yourself. I'm in love. Yeah, sorry. 
power went out, so I had to light up all the candles. Yeah. Yes, baby, yeah. Okay, I'm just glad our home phone's working and we're able to contact you. Welcome to the Marianas Eye Institute. Our office on Beach Road is staffed with U.S. certified eye care technicians, doctors that have received national recognition, and a friendly, professional staff that will look after you and your loved ones. With over 1,200 eyeglass frames to choose from and an in-house lab, we can make most glasses in about an hour. And we even feature a mobile clinic to bring eye care to you. Keep your eyes healthy and strong with professional eye care at the Marianas Eye Institute. Welcome back to the Channel 2 News. It's hard to predict when tourism will open back up in the CNMI, but once it does, Governor Torres says he has a plan for every individual to be tested for COVID-19 once they've landed in the CNMI. As much as uh, our revenue here is derives from our tourism, our priority and my priority with the administration and our public health is our health care. Um, and uh, I don't foresee uh, our numbers definitely not, will not be meeting those numbers uh, anytime soon. But I do know that we've done so much precautionary measures, so much preventive measures, that even uh, our tourism industry is going to change. That I know. Um, even now thinking, uh, talking about it, discussing it, the, our tourists that comes here, we welcome them when and if, well, when we open those, the borders, but we would want to have our own test kits ready here and mandate every tourist to come to the, that comes to the island to get our own test here and get swapped here uh, and make sure that everybody that's landing uh, will go through the same process. Uh, again, that's a security for us and also security for our tourists. So um, I know that we don't have tourists coming in yet, but those are the things that we're already planning ahead what we should do here uh, as MVA um, and to protect our nurses and doctors and everybody um, so that our cinema is, is viewed as a, a tourist um, destination that is, is safe and of course our, our beautiful um, natural habitat and environment. Grab and Go Lunch is back in operation feeding the children of the cinema. Take a listen. The grab-and-go meal distribution has kicked off once again for all children of the CNMI, where from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., children under the age of 18 can receive a free breakfast, lunch, and snack. Today we have a pepperoni pizza with uh, steamed carrots and garlic fried rice with uh, scrambled eggs. And with the fruits, we got apples, banana, and uh, the snacks, we gave uh, baked chips. And it comes with three drinks juice, water, and milk, and that's for the whole day. Yesterday we prepared uh, 10,000, 10,000 breakfast, 10,000 lunch, 10,000 snacks, and we distributed 9,100. 9,100 has kind of been our upper limit so far. Those, we've had two days where we've done 9,100. Uh, today, we, again, we, we prepared, actually we prepared uh, 10,175, I think, because we had to up, uh, up one of the schools in Rota and one of the schools on Saipan. Um, I had a call from Tanapag at 10.45. They were just then serving their last meals at 10.45. We've had a surplus every day in the Tanapag San Roque area since we started. A, a, a very comfortable margin, but today everything ran out really, really, really early. So we're going we're gonna to increase the number of meals, probably about 100, 150 for Tanapag next week. The program started back in March. But once the coronavirus reached the CNMI, the program was put on halt, starting back up this week. We wanted to start on Monday. And, and when we shut down uh, at the end of March, the target date was the 13th. We wanted to give it a, everything seems to be like a two week program, right? As soon as something weird happens, everybody just instantly gets into a two week. Oh, we need 14 days. Well, I'm not sure where that came from, but that's exactly what I did. I'm like, I'm hoping we can be back in 14 days. And that was the plan. And I know, I know that there are kids that need the meals. I know, that's why we're opened up again. But uh, I was happy to see that during the time that we were shut down is when food stamps reactivated. So April 1st until April 15th, till yesterday, 
families were able to go down and get their food stamps and be able to get to the stores and buy the buy the nutrition that they need and it, and it, in, in addition to what we're doing but uh, I felt a little bit better with the shutdown just knowing that the food stamp families were able to finally get into the food stamp office and get their benefits so now we're both running at the same time now we're able to fill in a lot of gaps the program is running at all the same school locations as before except for GTC we shut down GTC because the uh, two reasons. One is the participation wasn't very strong, and it was really close to Tanapag. And it's, we moved it to Tanapag, and everything at Tanapag has been going smoothly. The, the, the San Roque families and the Marpy families are just driving down, and no problem. It hasn't been a problem at all. Um, they were just a little close to each other. We were trying to hit the walkers, right? And the number of kids that were walking in at GTC from San Roque wasn't very much. So we just put everything in Tanapag. just made the operations a lot smoother. And what's different this time around is that children do not need to be present for the free meals. The parent or guardian may pick up food for the children by providing a form of identification, such as student ID or report card. How do you think about the free, the free lunches? It's good for the students. We are now in crisis, so it's helped a lot for the family. There's good. There's fruits, water, milk, and juice. Very good. I'd really like to thank all the families that uh, took the time to uh, get some sort of documentation for their kids. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the parents are coming through the line now and they don't have the kids with them because they're fearful of bringing the kids. But they've been bringing us all kinds of great things that we can look at very quickly. Um, birth certificates, uh, report cards, the schools that have school IDs, they're bringing that as well. So some of, the, some of the parents are rolling up and they go, I need five meals. And we're like, okay, I don't see any kids. And like, boom. And then they literally show us five different documents. We don't look in the names, but they show us five different documents of five kids. And we go, boom, there you go. There's your five meals. Thanks for coming. While some kids are speechless about the free meals. Hi, guys. Hi. What do you guys think about getting the free uh, breakfast and lunches? Yeah. Anybody? No? <laughs> Others feel the program is a good idea. How do you guys feel about getting free lunch and breakfast? Good. Roberts says the summer program will continue until August. Reporting for KSPN, I'm Ashley McDowell. Bye. Stay tuned because coming up after the break is the KSPN 2 weather report. We are with you. At times when you need us most, you can count on us to be there. When you need someone to talk to. When you need to stay informed. When you need to brighten your day. When you need to stay connected. We are here keeping our promise that while the world is changing, we keep working. So you can keep connecting. We are your Docomo Pacific family and we are here to help. At one of Saipan's beaches, this mother lays about a hundred eggs under the cover of darkness. She hides her nest as best she can and then slowly makes her way back to the ocean. The eggs hatch and the babies head for the sea where they will face a daily dose of danger. Just one in a thousand will make it to adulthood. Those that do will one day lay their own eggs. Sea turtles are protected under CNMI law. If you see one that is stranded or if you see illegal activity, Call the hotline at 287-8537. My family is on whole home Wi-Fi powered by Plume. Since we um, installed the Docomo whole home Wi-Fi, what did you guys notice about it? When you pull up the driveway, it automatically connects. And I don't have to get out of my car right away and come upstairs to go on my phone. My favorite thing is that it doesn't buffer when I'm watching YouTube. Um, my favorite thing is that when Addie calls now, there's no lag like before it used to be where I couldn't see her sometimes and I have to hang up and then call her back and now I don't have to do that. You know what's a good thing too is that when you come over to visit, I could give you your own password. I can assign a time limit so that I can say that you can only be on it for one hour so that means you won't get in trouble from your mom. And then you can go home. <laughs> the thing that I love the most is that I can freeze the internet for periods of time so that we can enjoy dinner time like this. <laughs> Why are you rolling your eyes? So I'll turn it back on after dinner. <laughs> Whole home Wi-Fi powered by Plume. Docomo Pacific, better together.
Here is your weather. For today, we had a high of 91, a low of 78, 58% humidity. Tomorrow, partly cloudy with isolated showers. East winds 10 to 20 miles per hour. Tomorrow, we'll have a high of 88, a low of 79. Seas 4 to 6 feet. High tide 5.42 a.m., low tide 11.10 p.m. Sunrise will be at 6.01 a.m. and sunset will be at 6.32 p.m. And thank you for watching the KSPN2 News. Have a great rest of your weekend and stay safe.